On behalf of Pastor Phil and the family of Believer's Christian Church, we are excited to sow this message into your life. Our mission at Believer's is to love God, love people, and serve both. Our prayer is that through this message, you will receive revelation that will bring a lasting change into your life. To find out more about us, log on to BelieversChristianChurch.com. We've been on a series called A Life of Purpose, and this is going to be the final uh, message in this series, and I have been so, so blessed by this. I have, God has increased me in, in, in my study time, and I feel encouraged. This has been our, this will be our seventh week, I believe, that we've been on this, and I, I, I'm, I'm excited to end it with the, the topic of endurance, because endurance is what we need uh, in order to see the promises of God come to pass in our life. We, uh, our biggest struggle is when you've obeyed the will of God and the promises still seem so far away. It's endurance that brings it from promise to possession. It's, it's one of the things that I meditate on most often because that is the real battle. That's the real question. That's the real rubber meets the road for most of us. When you read in scripture or you hear a preacher say something that's a, from the Bible, that's a promise, but you, here it is, you've said amen and there's a season before there it is. And it might be a second, it might be a, it might be a day, it might be a week, it might be a month, but that season from amen to there it is, is our warfare. And endurance is what it's going to take to get us from our promise to possession. Endurance is something that I think as a generation we lack, uh, especially my generation and after. Uh, we're very quick to give up. We're very quick to just lay down and just uh, take a defeat and just continue to lay down. And I'm, I'm just not okay with that anymore. I don't, I don't want that to be. In fact, I see it within Christianity. The scriptures, uh, especially in the New Testament, liken Christians to sheep uh, on a few occasions. And uh, this last week, I was talking to Joe about raising different animals, and the topic of sheep came up. And I, I, I've never seen a, sh a sheep get sheared before, and so I was kind of asking what that's like. And he said, well, actually, it's kind of interesting. At first, they don't want to be handled or touched or gathered, but once you grab them in the right position and turn them over, they go limp. He goes, sheep are very quick to give up. And you know, it seems like at times when we're up against it, we, we go limp and we just, we just give up so quick without a fight. And I, I want us to, to learn how to walk in endurance because the reality is uh, we, we talk frequently, mostly about the finished work of Jesus. So if it's finished, then why does my circumstance often look like something different than what the Bible says is a promise for me? We need endurance to see that come to pass. So this is a... Uh, something that I meditate on a lot. I want the Lord to help me, to show me, to teach this so that uh, we, can, we can have application and, and really see beyond just good theology. This has got to be more than just something that we can teach real well. It's got to be something that we walk in, that we live in, that it becomes part of who we are, not what we say. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's look at one verse first before I get into the primary part of my text. Hebrews chapter 10. The writer of Hebrews, I would think the way, the way I read it, sounds like he's got a bit of attitude, which I kind of dig. But in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 36, it says, For you have need of endurance. Depending on what version you have, it might say patience, steadfastness. Therefore, uh, excuse me, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Just because you and I have a promise from God does not mean you automatically possess it. Now that's going to mess with a, a few of our, our thinking or maybe even your theology. So give me the next 25 minutes or so to at least articulate where I'm coming from. That when you have a promise from God, it does not automatically mean that you possess it. Here's my first example. In Acts chapter 9, a, a man by the name of Saul is traveling around city to city, town to town, snatching up Christ followers, Christians, out of their homes, out of gatherings, and imprisoning them, torturing them, killing them, all for proclaiming this Christ. He thought he was doing a service for God. So one day, leaving one city to the next, which was a town called Damascus, he has an encounter with God. This bright, shining light impacts Saul, knocks him off his horse, and the, he has this moment where the, the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because Jesus was speaking to him in that moment, and when he was persecuting his people, he was taking it personal. Why are you persecuting me, Saul? And he has this moment where he's blind for three days, like scales over his eyes. But in the midst of that, there came a, an assignment for Saul, who would become Paul, Saul's life. 
Saul's assignment or promise, if you will, was you are going to bring this gospel to the Gentiles. Gentiles is not a term that we would typically use, but it's simply this. Anyone who is outside of the promised people, the Jews, I'm going to use you, Saul, to take this gospel, not just for the chosen people, but for everybody. And so he goes into the city. Another man uh, by the name of Ananias is spoken to by God. He says, go to him. He prays for him. The scales fall off his eyes. And immediately Saul begins to talk to other Jews and even goes into some of the synagogues and really freaks people out because this fellow was the one who was just grabbing people out of the churches and the other communities and trying to torture them. So he's ministering to them, but that wasn't the That wasn't the promise. That wasn't the plan. He wasn't going to go share the gospel with the promised people. It was, you're going to share this with the Gentiles. Now fast forward to Acts 13. 14 years later, right smack dab in the middle of a worship service. says they were fasting and worshiping and the Holy Spirit speaks and says, now separate for me Saul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them to do. 14 years later from the promise to the possession, The Apostle Paul didn't make his first missionary journey until 14 years later after he'd received it. There is a season of promise and possession. We're talking about endurance to get us there. That's one example. Second example, the children of Israel are captive in Egypt. It's a type and shadow of the world system, the the sin of the world that they were in bondage to. God releases them, is leading them out of the imprisonment, the bondage, the slavery of Egypt. It's an 11-day walk, approximately, from Egypt to the Canaan land, the promised land that God has said. But instead of taking that journey straight from there to the promised land, they wandered the desert for 40 years until that generation eventually died off. And it wasn't until Joshua, who, who was now going to lead the children of Israel to the actual promise. You receive a promise from God, but the possession of it, there's a season. You and I are navigating that season and endurance is the key. So sounds great. Sounds lofty. Let's get out of here. Let's just endure, right? How about some how-tos? Let's look at some some tools. I want to leave here because I'm so convicted about how important this is that if we get a hold of how do we get through this season, we will begin to see more possession uh, of these promises in our lives. Many of us, in fact, I'm going to say that probably a good portion of you have stopped short of what God had promised because of various reasons, discouragement, pains, uh, whatever outside influences, demonic attacks, whatever it is, many of us have stopped short and have given up on the promises of God. And I want that to change. I want that to change from the inside of us so that we are equipped to see the outside of us change. And we really need these things to come to pass, don't we? Some of us are in real dire situations. I need God to do exactly what his Bible says. So how do we walk this out? So turn with me in your Bibles to the Old Testament now, to Joshua chapter 6. We're going to be speaking about the, the walls of Jericho. Here is my warning to you. Do not discount the familiar story of Jericho and just over, overlook the value of what we're going to learn here or we're going to pull from this. Many of you, if you grew up in church, you're in Sunday school, you, you've been through the whole songs and you've marched around your rooms before, you know, pretending like the walls are coming down. And listen, this is, this is a, not a story, it's an account. Because when I hear the word story, I think make-believe. This really happened. They we're going we're gonna to see what God did here, and I believe that we can pull some truths out of it to help you with the, the fortified areas that are in your life. All right? You're already there, Joshua chapter 6. Let's read the first 16 verses. We're going to go on a marathon read here. Verse number 1 says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand, its king, and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. The seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. 
And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. So it was, when Joshua had spoken to the people, they had seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord, advanced and blew the trumpets. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets, and their rear guard came after the ark, while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed from your mouth, until the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, went out continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord, and the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once, returned to camp. So they did six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they arose early, about the dawning of the day, and they marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only, they marched around the, se the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened. When the priests blew the trumpet, the, and Joshua said to the people, shout for the, Lord has given this, or, uh, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Now just go down to verse number 20. It says, and they utterly destroyed, or excuse me, so the people shouted, when the priest blew the trumpets, and it happened. When the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. There are so many things that are in this passage that I'm believing that we are, uh, are going to be able to pull out of it. Number one is perspective. It's perspective. I, uh, I grew up hearing about Je uh, Jericho, and in my mind, I don't know if I just had this imagination of it or if I was told this or not, but I envisioned Jericho being a very large city. The truth is, Jericho was not a big city. It'd only take about an hour or so to walk the perimeter of the whole city. So what made the city so intimidating? It's thick walls. You, uh, you and I have promises uh, that we're believing for. But we feel the intimidation factor comes from the walls that surround it that keep us from obtaining these promises. But you'll notice the very first thing that, that uh, the Lord says to Joshua in verse number two, he says, look, see, I've given you the city. Now, that doesn't make one lick of sense. What do you mean you've given us the city? It's fortified. It's got these walls around it. Nothing's changed because God speaks to us in past tense in our current battles, our current warfare. Because he's already won it for us. So the intimidation wasn't that it was large. The intimidation was the walls. You also notice that uh, the, the way that God sent them around the city. If it were me, if I was the one that was uh, putting together the battle plan, I would have put the biggest, gnarliest, toughest looking dudes right out front. I'd want them to be the most intimidating thing that, that Jericho saw. But that's not what God did. He says he had them go around the city, put the worshipers out up front. Because the key to changing our perspective starts with worship. When you worship, it'll change your perspective to see it the way God sees it. We talked about that in our worship service. We're saying, holy, holy, holy. It brings the perspective back of how big my God is. And so now I'm less intimidated by the fortified walls of whatever is walling around your promise, your situation. I'm going to worship because I want, I want to change the perspective. I want to see this from God's perspective. God had already said to Joshua, look, see, I've already given it to you. When we worship, we're, we're agreeing with God that he already has given it to us. I'm worshiping as though I already have the possession of my promise. The, the other thing that I've I looked at this is, um, why did it say that the, the walls were so fortified in the first place? It was to keep Israel out because they were afraid of Israel. Our enemies were utterly and completely defeated by Jesus on the cross. There's not an enemy that wasn't defeated by Jesus. And so the, 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 the resistance and the pressures that you're feeling has nothing to do with the fact that they think they can beat you. They want you to think they can beat you. Perspective. You and I are, we need to realize that the resistance and the pressures I'm feeling is because my enemy knows if we find out who we are and whose we are, 
There's nothing that can keep us separated from these promises. So the, the number one thing here that with understanding endurance is perspective. The second thing is that progress isn't always obvious. Progress is not always obvious. There are things going on that we don't see. Are you, um, if you could imagine that uh, Joshua gives the assignment, guys, we're going to go march around the city, but don't say a word. Man, that would lose most of us. Be silent for an hour. <laughs> right? They couldn't say a word. No, nothing. So the assignment was, here we go, guys. We're going to go marching around the city and, and uh, you know, just follow my orders. And I get there and I get to around the city the first time and What do we do here now, Joshua? Go back to camp. Anyone remember the, the game Tetris? A couple of you. For those of you who don't know, it's, a, it's an old game and this little, little different shapes would fall down the screen and you had to rearrange them in such a way that you'd build a, a solid line. And when you built the solid line, it'd go doot doot and it'd drop. Can you imagine? You walk around, do my Jericho march, and I get around the city the first time and all of a sudden, doot doot. A little bit of the wall comes down. Man, I'd be skipping around the next time. I saw some progress there. I get around and all of a sudden, doo -doo, a little bit more of the wall comes down. But that's not what happened. You see, progress isn't always obvious. If it was, we'd love going to the gym. <laughs> right? And if you say you love going to the gym, you're lying. <laughs> Can you imagine going to the gym and every time you lift that weight, your muscles grow? Every single time you do a sit-up or you're planking, pow, 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 all of a sudden your abs are really tight. Man, we'd love it. But you know what happens when you're exercising is during the workout, you're not growing muscle. It's in the resting time that your muscles grow. How does this work for us as Christians? The work was done in Jesus. When you and I rest in the fact that Jesus did the work for me, now we begin to see the changes happen. That doesn't mean that we're lazy. Don't get me wrong. But I'm not working in this thing to try to get uh, something I've done to make these walls come down. Jesus was enough. And so I'm, I'm allowing this resting period to happen. There is a, there's a progress of things and many things that are going on in the unseen. Uh, about a year ago, just over a year ago, Lane and Domingo were still living in Mason. She was already working with me every day, making that trip out here. And so they had their house up for sale. And they prayed about it and, and had a number in mind of what they were going to list their house for. So they went to the realtor who they had used before and uh, said, this is what we want to post or, or list our house for. And he said, you're crazy. No one will ever come see your house for that, that number. So he gave them a number, what he thought. And uh, they stood on it. They said, no, no, we prayed about this. We're, we're going to stick with this. This is what we're going to list it for. He says, guys, you're wasting your time and mine. No one's going to come see the house for that, that price. Forty showings later, they, uh, they've had quite some time going by. You didn't catch that, did you? No one's going to come see your house. Forty showings later, okay? <laughs> God's doing a little something, something here. So 40 showings later, there's a few months have gone by. I remember it was on her birthday. I'd gone over to drop off a gift and I was frustrated. I'm like, man, we prayed over this house. Why is, why hasn't all these people have come through? Why have we have an offer on it? And I was, I was getting aggravated because I wanted them to be closer. And so here we are, it's a couple months in and um, there was a testing of the endurance process here and someone comes in with a lowball offer, <coughs> insulting offer, and uh, they weren't having it. And if I'm totally honest with you, I may have even encouraged them. You know what? You should take it. You know, I mean, get yourself over here. But they were, shame on me, but listen, that's what, I'm just being honest with you. <laughs> so they stood on it. They turned the offer down and they, they, kept, it, they kept it listed. It was, a, I think it was a weekend when they got the phone call. Yeah, it was a Sunday. It was a Sunday. Calls up, guy wants to see the house. He's in town, doesn't have another opportunity, doesn't even care what the house looks like, don't have to clean it. I know it's short notice, just want to get in it. This person comes in, looks at the house, comes back that day with a full price offer and they sell the house for the exact amount, which in that and of itself is totally awesome. But that's not even the key to this, this analogy. At the closing, they found out if they would have closed on that house even two days earlier, 
they would have been hit with a tax that for not being in that house long enough that they would have paid out at it. See, God was working this thing out in the, in the unseen. And so when it came to pass, he had a plan. So you and I can get really discouraged at times when we expect a certain outcome and God does it some way different. God's working out. You don't always see the progress of what's going on in the unseen. Another, uh, another story. We have a, a family here that uh, their parents are large farmers majority of the property that they farm is rented, it's leased. And so one, one uh, landowner had a, was disgruntled and, and pulled back some property. It was going to cost the farmer about $25,000 in income. So they came and had a conversation with me, wanted to know how to trust God and what scriptures to stand on. And, and we just spent a little time together, prayed together, and believed God. So the, the Lord, he was expecting, this individual was expecting that God would just replace that land with what was taken from him. But that's not what the Lord did. The Lord replaced the income and more, but this way he did it. He found oil on another piece of property. So he got more money than he was going to get, and he didn't have to labor for it. Jesus did the work. I'm resting in what Jesus did. Don't, don't get discouraged or off track if God doesn't do it exactly like you thought he was going to do it. There's some things going on in the unseen that we need to work out, which is the next point, endurance, which is tightly knit together with that point. The... The, the things that are going on in the unseen is often because God wants to do or have you and I focus on a victory that he wants to win in us before we focus on the victory that we want him to win for us. The, the, uh, in this particular account, you'll, you'll notice that God gave Joshua the assignment to walk around the city for six days, one time each day, and on the seventh day, walk around it seven times. Not very efficient. God's not interested in efficiency. Otherwise, on the first day, the first pass, he could have just knocked the whole walls down and then done, done deal, right? But God was doing something on the inside of Israel, I believe, that needed to take the six days to get there. It, throughout scripture, you'll see the Hebrew language, the number six in scripture always represents the number of man. The number seven is the number of perfection or uh, completion. It was the six days around that city that the Lord was doing a work inside of Israel to get them to a place where they knew that the seventh, the one who was going to make this happen, was going to be the one who was going to deliver every other nation in that promised land. If you read the rest of the account, the first nation, the first city that they came into this promised land was Jericho. There was a bunch more to come. And God needed to establish within Israel right now that the way we're going to overcome these nations in this promised land was going to be by his power, not theirs. So he had them go for six days so they knew for sure it wasn't them. On the seventh day, the perfection, the, the one who, who knew what he was doing, the one who provided the power brought the walls down. Secondly, you'll notice that, and you can go back and read this for yourself, when the Lord spoke to Joshua about the assignment, you're going to walk the six days one time, you're going to go on the seventh day, walk around it seven times. Go look for yourself. Joshua never told Israel that that's what they were going to do. They had no idea if it was day one, day 30, day 50, or day 100. They just knew, go march around the city. Now guys, imagine this. You go march around the city and you come back after your very first day and you go back and your wife greets you at your tent. And uh, so tell me, what did the God do? Um, I don't know. We went for a walk. I guess maybe Joshua was having a scope off the land or something. Day number two, you go for a walk. Wife and kids meet you at the entrance of your tent. So, yeah, we walked again. We weren't allowed to talk. You don't know how... How, how many times you're, you're going around this city personally. Let's take it personal now. And we stop on six. What if today is day number six for you? Tomorrow's day number seven. God's fixing to bring the walls down. If you stop today, then you'll miss out on the supernatural breakthrough that God has for you that's fortified around this promise that you're believing for. Don't stop on six. We, we could be on the eve of our seventh day. You'll notice too that in, in verse number 21, after the walls come crashing down, they didn't stop there. In verse 21, it says, And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. 
You and I have to resist the temptation to stop when the resistance has backed off. Can you imagine if they walked around the city, they made their shout, they blew the trumpets and the walls came down and they're high-fiving one another. They're excited, man, look, look what God did. But see, they didn't utterly destroy the enemy until they went through there and took the city. They killed the women and children and their animals. Now listen, we don't fight with swords anymore, but the, 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 the image here, the shadow here is important for us to understand. Don't settle for relief. Don't build a doctrine or a theology on this. Well, my, my, my marriage is better than it was. But it's not completely fixed. It's not, it's not totally brought back together. Well, my, I don't feel the pain in my body like I once did. It's better. But you're, you're not, don't stop short of total victory when God wants to bring a total restoration to your life. Don't, don't, uh, don't just say, well, my money's better. The finances are better than they were. But God wants to get to a place where he's totally in control of my finances and he wants to be the source and supply in my life. Don't stop short of total victory. We have another example. In 1 Samuel 17, it's the account of David. All of you, have, uh, even if you've never been to children's church, you're familiar with David and Goliath. It says that David took a stone in a sling. I think it's in verse 50. He launches the, the stone and uh, hits, hits Goliath. Goliath, it even says in the verse that he killed the giant. Can you, okay, so if I'm David and I, I sling a rock, I hit the, the, the giant in the head and he tips over, my temptation would be to run over to my pals. <laughs> He's, that's awesome. But that's not what he did. Without hesitation, he runs to the giant, he stands on his chest, he pulls the sword out, and then cuts the giant's head off, grabs it, shows it to the Philistines. It says that they, the Philistines were up on another ridge about a mile away. They didn't budge when Goliath tipped over. They had no idea if the man had, had tripped. They didn't know if he was wounded. It wasn't until David utterly destroyed him by severing his head that says that when, he, that when his head was removed, that the Philistines ran for their life, Israel chased after him and chopped them to pieces. We stop short of total victory for various reasons. And I'm saying this to encourage, not to condemn. Listen, God wants to, us to totally destroy these things. He wants to do it through us and for us so that this thing has no opportunity to regain strength. Wound somebody, they can get better, and then you have to fight them again. Destroy this enemy, crush it to powder so it can't come back, that this is no longer going to be something that irritates, nags at you, or even tries to come back and take your life. I'll tell you this, the enemy does not fight fair. There are no rules of engagement. There are no rules uh, that he has to follow. His goal is to come and torment you, and if he can, kill you. Let me wrap up with this one. In uh, 2 Kings, this is the uh, final passage for this morning. This is the story of the end of life for the prophet Elisha. Elisha is one of my favorite, maybe my favorite prophet of all. He is the predecessor to Elijah. Now, Elijah gets a lot of airtime. I mean, uh, he, he did a lot of great miracles. But personally, I think Elijah was a bit on the emotional side, unstable side. He was up and down, up and down. Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah did, and yet he gets very little airtime. So he's a very, uh, very awesome, powerful man of God. And here on his deathbed, he dies in a very peculiar fashion. But I think if we, if we pull what, what the essence of what's being said here, it'll encourage us even for our, our, uh, our moments right now. In 2 Kings chapter 13, verse number 14, it says, Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Now, initially when I was reading this, I thought, how awesome is that? That the king is he's weeping over the fact that Elisha is about to die. But that's not why he's crying. He's crying because he's got an enemy that wants to kill him. And he wants Elisha, even on his deathbed, to save him and, and, and perform a miracle. He's there selfishly, crying. Elisha responds in verse number 15. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, Open the east window. 
And he opened it. And then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. Verse 18. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck it three times and then stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck it five or six times. Then you would have, then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Then the very next verse, and then Elisha died. What an odd way to go out with such a powerful man of God. So just to recap for a moment, he, the king comes in, he's in trouble, the, the Syrian army is going to overtake him. He says, grab a bow, shoot the arrow through the east window. He does, he says, this is a, a symbol of God's deliverance. Now take, take the arrows in your hand and throw them on the ground. And so he does, he, he stomps the ground or hits the ground, strikes the ground three times. He didn't tell him how many times to strike the ground, but yet he says he's mad at him. Why, how do you get mad at somebody for not telling them what you're wanting from them? But I don't think that's what he's mad about. He's not mad at the king. What he's mad about here is that he's, he, he's, he's only going to strike this enemy three times. If he would have struck it five or six, he would have utterly destroyed it. Would you stand with me? I'd like to, I want to pray with you, but we're going to do something as an act of faith. Might make you uncomfortable, but I, it's good to be uncomfortable. <coughs> the king comes to Elisha and he tells him to strike the ground with the arrows. So he does it one time. Throw, does it a second time. Strikes the ground again a third time and stops. But Elisha says, if you would have struck the ground four and five, and six times you have utterly and totally destroyed this enemy. Some of you, maybe most of you, are in a battle right now where you've struck in the ground one time. And you've struck it three times. But you need to strike it four and five. Come on, who's with me? And five. Come on. As an act of faith, it's okay. Shake the floor a little bit. Let the kids know it. Just mom and dad up there stomping some demons. It's good. It's good. Four and five and six. And every time we strike the ground, we're utterly destroying our enemy. You see what's happening here? Because what God has started, he wants to finish. It's supernatural. Many of us have stopped short because we've been discouraged or we didn't see the promise come to pass. Struck it four and five and six times to utterly destroy this thing. Father, across this room, I thank you for an engagement with your people. Lord, an infusion of courage and boldness to trust you for total and ultimate, ultimate victory over our enemy. I thank you, Lord, for an encouragement that for those of us that have turned away from discouragement, we didn't see it, see it come to pass. And so we've drifted away. We're even wondering if these promises are true. The truth is they are. Father, we got discouraged in this season of endurance. Lord, infuse within us the power of the Holy Spirit to see from your perspective. God, we worship you and we make you bigger so that we see that you have already won the battle in Jesus. Lord, that we're, what we're not seeing on the, on the seen realm that's been operating in the unseen realm, that you're doing a work on the inside of us so that we will know on the back end of this that it was ultimately all God, his power, not mine. Nothing that I could do, nothing that I could earn, not by my strength, but by yours. And Father, I thank you even right now as we, as we face these enemies. Lord, we've seen the walls come down. We're not going to stop short of total and ultimate victory, that this life is more of a, uh, you have a life of purpose more than just getting through the day. But Father, within us, there's passions and there's a purpose, a life of purpose. Lord, I thank you that this is not the end for us. This is not the end. This might be our Jericho our first nation. But there's many other nations that are after this that the Father wants to utterly destroy on your behalf. His promises are true. And they're not for your neighbor only. They're not for someone else. They're for you. Father, I pray for the one who is so discouraged that it's hard to even look up I pray that you'd raise the head of the discouraged. Lifting our eyes off from our circumstance, off from our disappointments, and onto the one who brings hope, 
who is our comforter, who is the beginning and the end. Father, I thank you for the work that you're doing in us and certainly the work that you're doing for us. Thank you for endurance, Lord, that we would see the promises come to possession in Jesus' name. Now, with every eye closed and every head bowed, let me, let me just minister to you just for a moment. This whole series began as a life of purpose with the very first message, a life of purpose starts with a new beginning. The seed of Jesus. Everything that you and I need to have a life of purpose is found in Jesus. When Jesus is number one, when he's the center, everything else will fall in line. Jesus isn't just our fixed Saul. He's not the one that just makes us feel better. He's the one who brings back the unity to the Father. He brings a relationship that you and I can have, not one that we'll have someday when we, we go through the pearly gates, but he's, he's come that you might have relationship with the Father right now. But it takes an act of surrender. Jesus already purchased it for you. He purchased it for everyone. But you have to respond. A gift isn't a gift until you accept it. The gift of salvation is available to each one. If that's you this morning, if you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, the center focus of your life, then I want to pray with you. It's just me looking around. No one's looking around. But I need you to slip your hand up so I know who I'm praying with. Today is the day of salvation. Don't leave this place not knowing that Jesus is your source. That he's the one who came to purchase you, to give you life everlasting. Let me ask before we pray. There are some of us here that we stopped short. There was a promise that we were standing on. We were marching and I don't, I don't know how many days you were going around that city for you. But you got discouraged. Maybe even got angry. This God of promise is a liar. Is what some, of, some folks have thought because you didn't see it come to a place of possession and so you backed off. It's haunted you. It's robbed away your joy. It's messed with you. you. You lose sleep over it. In fact, you're here today and it's a struggle because that's exactly where you feel like you're at. I want to encourage you that the word repent in the Greek language means metanoia. It's, it's just simply changing your mind. You've been focusing on the wrong thing. If you'll change your mind away from your circumstance, away from the mistake, and turn to Jesus. It's as simple as following him. Changing your direction. Changing your focus. So across this room, Lord, I thank you for the comforter, the Holy Spirit. That woos us. That draws us close to the Father's heart. He loves you. He adores you. He's been doing everything he can to encourage you and to let you know that. And so, Father, I thank you that the wounded hearts are being healed even right now. The discouraged, those that have felt like they've let you down. They're here today to meet with you. I pray, Lord, that we would not leave this place the same. For the one who has never made Jesus the Lord of your life, and you didn't respond, but you should have, I just want everyone to pray this with me. Say, Father, I receive Jesus as my Savior. I believe that Jesus is enough. That, I, that by faith in Him, I am made righteous. I made whole. Empower me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We pray that you were blessed by this message. If you are curious about our ministry or would like to talk to someone, you can contact us through our website, BelieversChristianChurch.com.